Hello and welcome. This is James from the DSO Imager channel. Tonight I'm going to show the processing workflow I used on this shot of the Cocoon Nebula. Now what you're seeing here is uh, just an unlinked auto stretch of the stacked 33 hours of uh, uh, imaging. So I'm actually pretty impressed that the color came out good because I mean look here right if I link the channels we get red but unlinked in there. So it's all it's almost like the color is not too far off uh, from where it should be. Alright so the first thing I did was I ran dynamic background extraction and that got me here uh, and then I you, you see I got a little preview in here so I did color calibration next and that's with the color calibration. So again, if we uh, now if we link the um, uh, the auto stretch, the channels are linked. If you look at this, the uh, color is not too far uh, from what it uh, what the unlinked auto stretch gave us. And you know what? Now that I'm looking at this, I think I kind of like the <laughs> the unlinked auto stretch a little bit more. Uh, but anyway, I went forward with uh, with this here. Next up was to run Blur Exterminator. And let's see, I think this is it. Uh, yeah, so this is before. And that's after. So Blur Exterminator, as usual, does an amazing job. Uh, let's jump back. So it sharpened up the dust lanes a good bit. And it did a great job on the stars. Alright, next I use Star Exterminator to pull the stars out. So you can see the stars are over here. And this is what we ended up with without the stars. Now I got to this point and I'll be honest, I was a little bit disappointed with uh, how soft everything was looking in the nebula itself. I mean, it's not too bad, but... With the 33 hours, I was really hoping to resolve more in this area. And so I decided to push this image. Uh, I'm wondering if some of this is because I had questionable tracking throughout a large chunk of the data. But regardless, uh, what I did is I ran multiple iterations of Blur Exterminator. Uh, so let me actually demo this really quick. This is just an example of how you can do it. Now, the stars are already out, and generally you'd want to get the stars out because uh, if you keep applying Blur Exterminator with the stars in there, it'll, it'll do weird things. Your stars will look like square pixels <laughs> by the time you're done. Uh, so you see here I have the automatic PSS, P PSF unchecked. Right? With this checked, it... it um, will calculate a value based on the stars that are in your picture. Now you can uncheck this and manually plug in a value. Now a lot of times uh, what people will do sometimes with Blur Exterminator is they'll run a script. It's a script we used to use. Oh gee, I don't know if I can remember it. It's a, a, a script we used to use back when we ran uh, deconvolution manually. manually. It was a PSF, oh I don't remember. Uh, PSF calculator or something like that and what what that script would do is it would measure the PSF of your stars and then what you can do is put that value in here manually if you wanted to but on a starless image there is no PSF uh, but you can play with this slider and kinda guesstimate a PSF and and it's something that you can play with to tune it. So just as a demo, I've made a preview here and uh, we're going to run another iteration with this manually entered P PSF. Now I'll probably stop the recording since this will take a moment or two and uh, show you what the results look like. Alright, so just finished and this is what we got. So now I'm going to do uh, shift Control z to toggle between. Alright, so that's before and that's again. So that actually did a really nice job. We can actually now see some detail in here. 
and I mean if you're if you want to get greedy you can actually uh, apply it a third a third time <laughs> but if you keep applying it eventually you you get something that looks kind of artificial so uh, I did apply it two more times and I think it's these here so let's see just to do a comparison okay so yeah you can see a difference in here and this looks pretty good and you know maybe I should have kept it but I got a little greedy and I hit it one more time and there so definitely see more detail you do pay for it a little bit because it is noisier now than it was but the center of the um, of the uh, nebula is so bright that it doesn't even matter and if it was really an issue you could always use a mask I think I may have actually used a mask and mask this area off this shouldn't look yeah see this doesn't look any different so I had a mask and that way it only applied blur exterminator to the bright area which is what I want to hit and the goal was to try to just sharpen it up a little bit try to get a little bit more of a wispier look uh, with these uh, with these uh, dust lanes in there and you know what I think I, I actually got really greedy <laughs> I applied it another time let's see how this looks here what I had done is I made a mask because more iterations of Blur Exterminator were starting to do weird things to this reflection area down here. So I had created a mask and um, to protect that area and there. So I mean with this comparison right here, pretty, pretty significant difference here. How's it compare to this side here? Yeah, I think this is why I went because it it's I feel like this was getting to the to the threshold of overcooking it. Uh but I think it's just enough. I don't know. What do you guys think? You think this is overcooked? Should have kept it with this version or maybe just leave it like that. Yeah, see, this is just too soft for my taste. Uh, but anyway, the one on the left is the one that I proceeded to uh, move forward with. Alright, so next was stretching. I used the generalized hyperbolic stretch, and this is the first stretch. And next. And ended up here after the stretch. Alrighty, so made a clone just as a kind of a saving my step and moving forward. And here is mostly curves work. Now you can see I got a mask on here, so the goal is to try to brighten uh, this area here. Um, you know what? I'm jumping ahead of myself a little bit. So I shot Cocoon last year with my 115 millimeter refractor, so a good bit wider of a field. This is also HA LRGB so the colors and the nebula are a little off and I have this background HA but I was using this image as kind of a reference I mean this whole area is all very dusty and so I was trying to reveal some of that faint dust here. I didn't want it to be too dark. I didn't want to look like the nebula was isolated all by itself without any of this excess dust here and so that's why you see me masking the nebula and doing work on these fainter regions out here because there is definitely more data out here but of course it's faint so the risk is if I push it too much uh, then uh, it's it'll look very noisy and you end up getting that kind of 
moded, mottled, mottled, patchy, patchy, muddy look. Uh, this area right here in particular, it's already starting to look that way. So I needed to be careful. So any more, more curves work. Uh, I had a hard time with this back area really deciding how bright I want it to be and how contrast I want it to be. And even though you, for the next step you see I invert the mask and start working on the nebula itself, I came back to this bright field, or I mean I should say the, wi the wider area, this darker area, and continuously tweaked it back and forth trying to find a uh, balance that I liked with the dust. It was, it was hard to get to something I was satisfied with. Alright, so inverting the mask and now doing a little bit of curves work inside the mask. Uh, and then what you see here is this is all the brighter dust area and I didn't want to pull out too much in the darker areas. And then we ended up here. I thought this was a good stopping point so I made another clone uh, to continue work. And actually I don't see any changes here. It's smoother. So you know what? For this part of it, I applied noise exterminator. You know, I think the the centers, I mean, it looks okay. It's a little... Like I said, I think I rode that, that threshold of overcooking it <laughs> right, right on the line. I mean, it looks all right. But it's not as clean as I would have expected 33 hours. All right, we have a mask on this. Uh, all right, so I must have did more work. Yeah, okay, there we go. So I'm doing some more work in the nebula itself. Very faint curves work. And I got to, let's see, around this point. See, so, so notice, <laughs> you could see where I was waffling in my decision, right? All right, darkening up the nebula, that's fine, because pulling back on curves uh, on the bright nebula actually helps reveal some detail that's kind of hidden out. So I felt just by pulling back on the curves I was increasing contrast a little bit. There I'm darkening the background. I took the preview box away and then the next step <laughs> I brighten it up. Look and there's a mask back on there and now I'm masking the nebula. So I'm, I'm my brain is constantly in this tug of war about how dark or how bright I want the uh, background dust to be. All right, this is really some subtle curves work going on here. Let's see what kind of mask is on there. Yeah, just work in that dusty area around the nebula. Yeah, it's kind of funny seeing it go dark, bright, dark, bright, dark, bright. All right, so I took this and I went into Photoshop and I tweaked it ever so slightly. You know, let's leave this up. And here we go with Photoshop. So in Photoshop, it was mostly uh, some tweaking with the um, uh, the camera raw filter using dehaze and clarity and a, a little bit of contrast and then some vibrance and saturation. So I think overall, the overall color came out pretty good. I was pretty much happy with the brown dust. I'm not 100% sold on it, but yeah, anyway. <laughs> so after this, I just did some work on the stars. Uh, all I did with the stars was I stretched them a little bit, made sure there was no green in there. I uh, then used pixel math to put them back together and a lot of other tweaks, but this is what I ended up with. So there it is, a Cocoon Nebula, 33 hours worth, and I am definitely moving on to a different target. <laughs> I know the question comes up frequently about why I uh, do so many hours. I mean, one of the best ways, I think, to really improve your images is to kick up that integration time. There's definitely a significant difference in how your final image looks when you compare your shot 
of say 6 to 10 hours to 18 to 25 hours. So it's in my opinion it's definitely worth it to, to go for more hours if at all possible. And especially if you're in light pollution. I mean I can't compare with anyone that's shooting in Bortle 2 or Bortle 1. Uh, but where I can kind of come close in certain cases is making up with total integration time. So it's really the only thing that I have going besides you know improving the gear, the telescope and the mount and whatever that I can get the most out of these pictures. And because I'm running three rigs it is easy to just park an individual scope on a target and it's it's been the case where I even sometimes forget that I that I could change targets or I lose track of how much time I've actually accumulated and it's a surprise when I start counting up all the subs that I have so that happens and I think overall it's been a benefit now we've had a lot of clear nights uh, most of September and most of October so far has been clear now we're we're finally getting some rain. I mean, as an astrophotographer, I feel a bit conflicted, but uh, we're we're we've, we're in a severe drought here in Central Texas. The nearby lake is down like 50 feet from being full. It's at like I don't know 30, 40 percent full. So we definitely could use the um, the rain. And there's a system that came across the uh, west coast that's deluging us right now, and it looks like for the next seven or eight days at least we have rain in the forecast so I'm not going to be able to get any data uh, anytime soon but because I've had so much clear nights I am actually sitting on a lot of data some of the targets I had planned to get more data on but I mean given this uh, week and now the moon's getting brighter anyway uh, I think I'm just going to process what I have and slowly uh, roll it out. So be on a lookout uh, with this 533 MC and Celestron Edge combination. I have M77 which is a galaxy and I have Deerlick which is a galaxy as well or a few galaxies. And then with my AT115 EDT I did start with uh, M33 Triangulum. I got about 10 hours on it. Uh, I think I'm going to try to wait out this weather and get more data on there. But I also have information on NGC 300. That is the Southern Pinwheel Galaxy. I've got about 17, 16 hours on that. And that being such a low target with such a limited uh, window for me, it, it just barely peaks 20 degrees off the horizon. So I'll probably go ahead and process that and put a video out on that one. It won't be one of my better images. That's more more or less one of those stealing from the Southern Hemisphere. So. <laughs> I'll, I'll accept the uh, lower quality data on it. And then also another galaxy, NGC 891. Uh, and that, that field of view with that 115, there's actually a ton of galaxies in that field of view. So it's really cool. Uh, I really like wide field galaxy shots. Uh, and then uh, with my 65 PHQ, I actually shot enough data to do a two panel mosaic on the Veil Nebula. Uh, finished collecting all the data. I think it's about 20, 25 hours per panel of, um, of HOO. And uh, I just have to sit down and uh, knock that one out. So with the poor weather coming up, I should have that chance. All right, so uh, that's all I got for everyone tonight. Uh, please give it a like and subscribe if you're not already subscribed. Drop a comment in there and let me know what you think of my processing on this image. Uh, constructive criticism, criticism is always welcome. All right, clear skies, everyone. Good evening.